In this lesson, we're going to take a look at key constitutional principles. The overriding concern that the framers had was to ensure that they gave the national, the new national government enough power to function uh, without giving it a way for individuals or a group within the government to continue to grab more power. All right? This is the idea of limited government. It also includes the idea that everybody working in government is, is bound by the laws. Nobody is above the law. So when the framers attempt to ensure that uh, no individual or group within government could go on a power grab, they separated the job of running the government into three separate branches. This is known as separation of powers. And you can see in front of you that they created a legislative branch, which became our Congress. And the primary task of the legislative branch is to make laws. The executive branch primary purpose is to enforce the laws. That, of course, is the president and the vice president, and the judicial branch is the Supreme Court and lower federal courts. Their job is to interpret the law. The specifics of the structure and powers of each branch are listed in the articles listed there in the Constitution. Article 1 for the legislative branch, Article 2 for the executive branch, Article 3 for the judicial branch. In addition to just separating the powers, the framers ensured that no individual could go on a power grab through the concept of checks and balances. The checks and balances, you can see here, one branch helps another to do its job. And by helping that first branch do its job, it's actually limiting that branch's power. The best way to really explain this is to show by example. And this slide shows all of the different possible examples that the three different branches use. I'm going to highlight a couple of different examples here just to illustrate the concept of checks and balances. Do keep in mind on the Regents exam, when they ask a checks and balances question, the answer is going to have two different branches of the federal government in it. That's how we know this is a checks and balances question. So, for our examples, legislative branch up on the left here, Congress makes the laws. However, bills pass through both houses of Congress, and then they go to the president's desk. Right? He can sign them into law, or he can veto the bill. So, it's an example of one branch, in this case the executive branch, checking or limiting the power of the legislative branch. Going the other way, the president gets to choose uh, federal court judges, all federal court judges. So when a vacancy occurs, the president can pick an individual. That's a tremendous amount of power when you think about it. Well, it turns out that the Senate and the legislative branch has to ratify the president's choice. And of course, the senators could choose if they want to, and they have done this before. They could reject the president's choice and force the president to pick someone else. All right, a last example involving <clears throat> excuse me, involving the judicial branch. The Supreme Court has the power to declare laws that Congress makes unconstitutional, which is a check or a control by the judicial branch on the legislative branch. So those are several examples of checks and balances. The concept that seems to give students the most trouble is this concept of federalism. And again, it was put in just like separation of powers and checks and balances to prevent the federal government from grabbing more power. And the concept of federalism is simply that the federal government has powers. Those powers are listed in the, de in the, in the Constitution. We call them delegated or expressed powers. And you see some of them in the, inside the blue circle. The point here is that the powers that the federal government has are listed in the Constitution, and that's it. They are a finite list of powers. The state powers, which are listed here in the red circle, this is only a partial list, and the reason for that is that state powers can continue to grow. The Constitution states in the Tenth Amendment that all powers not expressly delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states. So while the federal government's powers are limited, 
the state's powers are not. They can, as future things begin to happen, they can grow. So, for example, uh, automobiles were not around 200 years ago, 200 plus years ago when the Constitution was written. Yet driver's licenses are a state responsibility. So, another way of looking at this, uh, we uh, students often think of the federal government as above the states. And yes, federal law is supreme over state law, but this really only comes into play when a state, when language in a state law conflicts with a federal law. Uh, a better way of looking at it is the way you see here, where the federal government and the state governments are, are equal. They're, they're side to side because the national government has specific jobs to do and the states do different jobs so they are not one it, it's not beneficial to think as one above the other more it more along the lines <coughs> excuse me of two different levels of government that have different jobs to do sort of side by side as we can see here do notice though the area inside the Venn diagram uh, where the circles intersect right in the center there those are powers that both the federal government and the states share so you can see the first one says raising taxes the federal government taxes us in a variety of ways income tax being the most obvious all right, the state governments have the power to tax us as well. There's a federal court system. There's a state court system. Both the federal government and the states can borrow money and so on and so forth. All right, this is the concept of federalism. The framers wanted to make sure that the Constitution would be able to adapt to uh, changing society. They certainly couldn't predict everything or, or much of anything that could happen in the future. Uh, the same way we couldn't predict what life is going to look like 50 or 100 years from now. So what they did was they added language to the Constitution to allow for the Constitution to adapt to changing needs. The elastic clause here is an example of that very flexible language that they created. And in this case, the elastic clause refers specifically to the powers of Congress. And, and as you can see here uh, in the blue slide, that you have the language of the elastic clause in quotations that Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. Of course, words like necessary and proper are intentionally vague and this was put in to allow Congress to make laws over many many different things that the framers couldn't predict. So this has allowed Congress to pass legislation over things uh, and allow the government and the Constitution to remain relevant. Additionally, the framers provided a way in the Constitution for amending or changing or adding to the Constitution. You can see here from this slide, if you count up the number of different ways, there are two ways to propose an amendment and then two additional ways to ratify. So taken together, there are four possible ways to amend the Constitution. There really is only one way that we need to be concerned with because while there are 27 amendments, 26 of the 27 amendments have been added to the Constitution this way. The Congress, two-thirds of the members of both the House and Senate, have proposed an amendment and then that amendment was sent out to the state legislatures and three-quarters of the state legislatures have to ratify the amendment. When you think about it, this is actually an example of federalism as well in that the federal government has the responsibility of proposing an amendment and the states have the responsibility of ratifying the amendment. So again, Neither job is more important than the other. There are two different levels of government that have two different jobs to do. Taken together, the result is an amendment 
that is then added to the Constitution. Now, do keep in mind, there are many, many amendments proposed, uh, but most of them never make it out of Congress, and never make it to the states. So then, just to sum up, the key constitutional principles that we learned support the idea of limited government. Separation of powers divides the national government into three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. Uh, do keep in mind, not all democracies divide their governments this way. Parliamentary democracies actually combine the legislative and executive functions of government into the same body, the, the parliament. Checks and balances is the idea that one branch needs to assist another branch in helping that branch do its job. By doing that, it's actually checking or limiting the power of the first branch. The examples that I gave you, one of the examples that I gave you is the president gets to pick federal judges. The Senate from the legislative branch gets to ratify those appointments. Federalism is the third example of limited government that we looked at, where the national government and state governments have different jobs to do, and that the federal government's jobs are listed in the Constitution, their powers are delegated to it, and they're limited. That's it, to what is in the Constitution. The state's powers are reserved powers, and those can continue to grow. And that's an attempt to limit the power of the national government, or at least prevent the national government from, from amassing more power. All right. In addition, we looked at today at the flexibility of the Constitution, and that includes intentionally vague language, like the elastic clause that we looked at, and the ability to amend or add to the Constitution. And I pointed out that there are 27 amendments that have been added to the Constitution. Now keep in mind, needing a two-thirds majority vote of both houses of Congress and then the three quarters, uh, three quarters of the state legislatures having to ratify the proposed amendment, you're looking at an issue that must be uh, very popular for it to be added to the Constitution. That brings us to the end of this one.